If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, we're going to read the first four verses. There are virtues that the Bible talks about that so often we have different ideas about. Because of the world that we live in, it takes the virtues that God has given to us in Scripture and it kind of makes their own version out of it. And so we need to look at what Scripture has to say about what God has to say about these different virtues that maybe we have lost sight of that are a little bit warped in our vision. So we're going to look at unity today. Let's read the first four verses of Matthew chapter 10. He, Jesus, called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. That's where we'll stop. There's a lot of division in this world. There's a lot of differences between us. And there's a lot of that even going on right now. Politically, we are very divided. This is the political map as of last election. There's a lot of red and there's a lot of blue. And this can fluctuate from election to election. But let's uh, look at the next map here. This is if you put it by county, and if you mix the colors together, there's a lot of purple there, isn't there? We have a lot of different ideas about the direction of our country and where that needs to go. Three out of four Americans believes that the United States is greatly divided when it comes to the country's most important values, according to a poll that was just released this past week. When uh, Lester Holt was interviewing President Trump, he asked him, do you feel like you're fighting for your legitimacy sometimes, that your legitimacy is under attack? And Trump's response was, well, we have a very divided country. Indeed, we do. We live in a time, especially, when the differences and the divides are are very sharp. There's a lot of divisions about, about race, too. The vast majority of adults in this country agree that a lot of anger and hostility between ethnic and racial groups in America there's right now. 84% of Americans said that. And this was true, remarkably so, it says, across the board. No matter the age group, religion, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or faith segment, the vast majority of each group believe there is tension among racial and ethnic groups in this country. We're we're divided racially and ethnically, too. And then there's class. Class, as in your socioeconomic class. Are you upper class? Are you middle class? Are you you lower class? There's there's someone named Ruby Payne who talks about these different classes and how each one kind of has its own culture, its own set of rules, its own way of thinking, its own set of priorities. I have a little chart up there about some of these here. There's, this chart is, is actually much bigger. These are just a few things. But there's a lot of hidden rules of the different social classes so that we think differently about different things and we don't interact together very well. So in, for possessions, when you think about what, what you have, if you're, if you're in poverty, people are, are your possessions. The, the people in your life are, that's, that's what belongs to you. In, in middle class, it's, it's different things and wealth. One-of-a-kind objects are, are what, you, what you prize. When you think about money, if you're in poverty, money is to be spent. When you, when you have money, you, you spend it. You spend it while you have it. If you're in the middle class, you, you manage your money. You think about it in terms of how you're going to organize it and make the best out of it. And if you're wealthy, you think about investing it. How can you multiply it? And time. 
If you're in poverty, you focus on the present. You think about today and this week most often. If you're in the middle class, you think about the future. You make decisions based on how it's going to affect you in the future. And uh, if you're wealthy, you focus on traditions and history, where you've come from. Decisions made on the basis of tradition and certain kinds of decorum. There's a lot more that could be said here, but we think differently depending on how much money we make. So there's a lot of division in this world. There's a lot of things that divide us, and there's a lot of need and hunger for unity in this world. That's a, that's a deep need that people have, and we seek it and we look for it. And so the world has an answer for this. The world's unity is, you might call, diversity. This is the world's answer to our divisions. So we have a lot of divisions, we have a lot of differences, so, so the answer is, well, let's just celebrate our diversity. And so this is why when you see advertisements, they deliberately feature people of all different shapes, sizes, cultures, and genders. This is why colleges have quotas based on race for the sake of diversity. And this is why TV networks are criticized if they have too many shows with white men in them. That was a headline I saw just this week. CBS draws fire for all male new shows. We, we want diversity because this is something to be celebrated. If we have differences, we can, we can get along together. We just have to celebrate this diversity. So I have a couple pictures here. There's that one there. Diversity is the one true thing that we all have in common, celebrated every day. We celebrate just diversity for diversity's sake, almost. Um, there's another one here that I have. If you want to hit that, okay. The beauty in the world lies in the diversity of its people. So, so diversity is a, is a beautiful thing. We should, we should celebrate that or enjoy that diversity. And there's a bumper sticker here. You've probably seen this one. Or at least I have it a bunch of times. Just celebrate diversity. This is something to be celebrated. We're, we're different. Isn't that great? Differences are, are a good thing, not, not a bad thing. There's a Thomas Paine quote. How many of you have actually heard of this guy, Thomas Paine? Oh, actually, all right, quite a few. All right, very good. The world is my country, all mankind are my brethren, and to do good is my religion. This is, this is the religion of the world. This is, this is the kind of diversity that we have. This guy was actually very influential in starting the American Revolution. The pamphlet that he published called Common Sense was published in 1776 and is credited with actually igniting the American Revolution. So these ideas are even in our DNA. And uh, one more here. This is on our, our coins and our currency. E pluribus unum. Who knows what that means? One, two, three, four, five? All right, if you know what it means, shout it out. Out of many, one. Yeah. So this concept of diversity is rooted in our country, the beginning of our country, and who we are as a nation. This is, this is the world's answer to our differences. Let's celebrate our differences. Let's see how cool that is. But there's a problem with that. Diversity doesn't work unless there's something to unite us. It's very difficult to celebrate diversity for diversity's sake. In fact, they, they do studies on this. People are drawn together by commonalities, not differences. It, it, in psychology, particularly social psychology, they... They've tried to figure out, okay, do opposites attract? Because that's a common thing that we have, right? Opposites attract, differences bring us together? No, not at all. In fact, if you look at couples, if you look at friendships, 
it's always based on something that is, you have in common. Whether that's your, your job or where you live or your race or your religion or your politics or something like that. You need something in common to come together. We, we, need, we need something to unite us. To celebrate diversity for diversity's sake just doesn't work. We need something to bring us together. There was one, one study at Michigan State that I came across once, and it was trying to do some, some computer models of, of what, how, how you could have a, a diversity like in a group of people. And then they, they ran into all these problems, and, and they said, this is, this is almost impossible. We, 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 we don't know how this could work. You, you, if you have diversity, you're going to lack cohesion. And if you have cohesion, you're going to lack diversity. So somehow you have to have some balance in there because you, can't, you have to pick one or the other. To have diversity, we need something to unite us. So the world's answer of unity is diversity. But there's a unity that the gospel brings us. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is Jesus Christ is the great unifier. He's the one who brings people together. This, this passage that we read, maybe, maybe you're wondering why I would read this. I mean, this is just a list of names of the 12 apostles. What's so special about that, right? Well, if you, if you were living in this time... This would be a big eye-opener when you heard these names. In verse 3, it says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. Matthew the tax collector. Okay? Tax collectors were Jewish people working for the Romans. That That means you were Jewish, and when Rome occupied your country, you decided, I'm going to break with my people, and I'm going to join in with these over, overlords here, the people who are occupying our country, and I'm going to work for them, and I'm going to tax my own people on their behalf. You're throwing in your lot with the occupying force. They got rich off their own people under the authority of that occupying force. It wasn't, they weren't just working for them. I mean, if that wasn't bad enough, I mean, you're basically betraying your own people in your own country. They got rich off their own people based on this occupying force under their authority. They were allowed to take and demand as much money as they wanted. So they weren't really held accountable to, okay, this person made this much money, so they owe this much tax. No, they could just basically say more, 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 and you had to give it to them. There was no accountability there. These people got rich off their own people because of the occupying Romans. Matthew, the tax collector. This is one of Jesus' 12 apostles here. He was a tax collector. Then in the next verse, it says, Simon the Zealot. Zealots were Jews who violently opposed Roman rule. They weren't weren't just opposed to it. They were violently opposed to it. When Jesus was Crucified, he was crucified between two thieves. And when he was convicted or sentenced to be crucified, there was somebody who was escaped or let go. Instead, his name was Barabbas. It says that he had committed murder in the rebellion. He was a, he was a zealot. So there were these small groups of Jews who were basically terrorists who were saying, we are not going to put up with this Roman rule because this is a pagan country led by a pagan emperor that is worshipped. We are going to do whatever we can to get rid of these people, 
even if that means terrorism and bloodshed, and we will do it. And one of their big, big problems was paying taxes to a pagan emperor because God deserves our allegiance and our money, not a pagan emperor. So they did not pay taxes. They opposed that. They believed that allegiance was due to God alone. They were violently opposed to Roman rule. So, among Jesus' 12 apostles, we have a tax collector and we have a zealot. We have one who is aligned with Rome and gets rich off of Rome and we have one that is violently opposed to Rome and would kill because of that. Tax collectors and zealots had violent hatred for one another. They didn't just dislike each other. They hated each other. They would kill each other if they could. If Simon the zealot and Matthew the tax collector had met in a dark alley, only one of them would have left that alley alive. But Jesus brought them together. Jesus brought them together. People who were violently opposed to one another, violently hated each other, Jesus brought them together. That's incredible. So, if this were today, it might be something like Matthew, the member of the KKK, and Simon, the leader of the Black Lives Matter movement. These people hate each other. Or, Matthew, the gun-toting American patriot, flag-waving guy, and Simon, the card-carrying member of Al-Qaeda. Jesus brings them together. It's Jesus who is the great unifier. You can't overcome differences like that by just celebrating diversity. You need somebody like Jesus to come in and say, hey, you need a savior. Let me save you. And only in Christ can true diversity be celebrated. You need something to unify us. He is what unifies us. He brings people together who would otherwise kill each other even And we need to focus on Christ in order to celebrate that diversity. All right, I'm going to just tell you my opinion here a minute. In the Christian Reformed Church, if you look at our history, we have a long history of being a a very Dutch denomination. And even to this day, I think like 70, 80% of the Christian Reformed Church is Dutch, right? Well, there was a time maybe 100 years ago when people were really concerned about staying Dutch. We wanted to stay Dutch because this was part of this, our orthodoxy and believing rightly about Jesus Christ was tied into being Dutch. And so there was a big fight over speaking Dutch in worship. I mean, obviously we don't speak Dutch in worship anymore, but that was a big fight for a long time. And people were really upset when services would go to English. But today, Dutchness my opinion, Dutchness is a liability now in the Christian Reformed Church. Because what I'm running into now is people saying, my grandfather started this church. My great-grandfather started this church. I belong here. And so if I don't believe the same things as you, or if I don't agree with the Christian Reformed Church on this, that, or whatever, you can't kick me out because I belong here. As if it's Dutchness that defines us as a church now. I'm running into these these arguments. And I don't want to say, no. This is not what brings us together. 
We are not bound together by being Dutch. We are bound together by Jesus Christ and what the gospel teaches. And if you're not on board with that, then find another church. Jesus unifies us only when he is supreme. He has to be number one or we will not end up together. If Christ is our focus, then things like carpet color or worship music or the design of a sanctuary, this stuff becomes superfluous. You know, who cares? If Jesus Christ is number one, we can, we can have disagreements about some of these things and we can work through it. And if I don't get my way, that's okay because Jesus is the, what's most important here. And if we're serving him well and we're doing what he wants us to do, that's what's most important. But there's too many stories about things like carpet color and worship music and, and the design of a sanctuary that's driving people apart. People within the same church actually hate each other because of these disagreements. If Jesus is not number one, these things are going to divide us. Even silly things like that. When Christ is not our focus, the church breaks apart under its differences. I came across this story this week. And I wanted to read it to you because this... This really shows these differences and how this comes apart. This is, this is in a Dutch Reformed church in South Africa in about the 1820s. This is what happened. There's council minutes that mention a bastard, the actual word used. This person is later named Ventura, who wanted to be confirmed and baptized as a member. He wanted to join the church. So the council said they had no problem with that. They said, ask the minister to give the proper guidance for making profession of faith. But then somebody asked if such persons should be allowed to take the Lord's Supper with born Christians. Should we let them take the Lord's Supper together with us? The minister tried to say that there should be no discrimination, especially at communion, which is supposed to be a symbol of our unity together in Christ, the congregation should be pleased that people such as him would share in this Christian privilege. But the council didn't agree. The council decided to follow the practice of neighboring churches that served communion to whites first and then blacks. And not only just whites first, but men first and then women. When this Ventura man was baptized, he took communion along with the white members, and people were not happy about that. At the next council meeting, there was the deacon who announced how unhappy that people were, that he would dare to take the Lord's Supper with the born Christians, and if it happens again, that they would not take communion at all. The minister tried to say, such an attitude, this is not Christian. The council though, decided on a strict separation policy. Blacks and whites may not take communion together. At the next council meeting, the minister was arguing that the Lord's Supper is an occasion where mutual love should be among all Christians and that should be promoted without discrimination. An elder found a verse in 1 Corinthians 8 that says, If eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. Therefore, if Ventura's presence at communion caused annoyance, then he should not participate. The minister says, applying that passage that talking about meat to the Lord's Supper, that doesn't doesn't work. At the next communion, many were absent. An elder left during the sermon. Two deacons left during the hymn of response. At the next council meeting, the elder who left stated that the minister insulted him by rejecting his proposal of segregated communion and he made, that he made him a remark from the pulpit about people taking communion elsewhere. And this elder said, I would no longer be giving any money to the church. And he quoted Deuteronomy 23, verse 2, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, therefore this man cannot partake of the Lord's Supper. The minister said, Is there any concern about this man's moral behavior? 
And the answer was no. It was just because he's black. This matter went to classes and then Senate, and then the Senate decided that, nope, people should be taking communion together. But nobody heeded that decision. Whites continued to form separate congregations from blacks, or at least assigned separate seating to blacks, usually putting them in the back or in the balcony. In one congregation, the church administered communion to blacks for the first time, and tension mounted because even though communion was administered separately and in a separate building, the people wanted only Christian doctrine taught, but not give them the sacraments at all. Then in 1857, the Senate decided, while it's desirable and according to Holy Scripture, that black members be accepted into our congregations, our congregations, if there is weakness of some, then they should have a separate building. Even though this is what Scripture says, we are not going to do it. If Christ is not our focus, differences divide us. We can only focus on what the world sees and not what Christ sees. And we go our separate ways. And we will even violate Scripture itself to do that. The truth of the matter is that Jesus draws people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. There's people all over the world who the Holy Spirit is working on and drawing them to Jesus Christ right now as we speak. Look at the screen here with me, if you would, and let's answer this question together. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church? I believe that the Son of God, through His Spirit and Word, out of the entire human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. And of this community, I am and always will be a living member. So there, in the end, there are going to be people from every tribe, nation, and language, from every time period of history, And we are going to be one in Christ. And it says that we even even now, I am and always will be a living member. That's already the reality here. One day all his people will be together in a new earth. Revelation 7, 9. I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Because in the end, it's Jesus that brings everybody together. All kinds of people from all over the world, from all different times and places, and he is going to bring us together, and that is going to bring him glory. Look at what he can do. People who don't even speak the same language, don't even think the same about anything else, they come together because of him. Nothing can do that except him. If today's tax collectors and zealots could come together in Christ, we could show the world what truly unifies. We could demonstrate that. We could say, hey, you want real unity? Come to Christ. He's what unifies us. This is the thing that we can have in common, that we can come together in, and we can actually celebrate some real diversity here. If we could come together in Christ, we could show the world what truly unifies us. I had lunch the other day with, with a, he's a professor at Calvin College. He's an African-American man, but he, he's a member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, a very strict denomination. But he's also a Democrat. So we have a man who's, who's part of a strict Congre- or Presbyterian church who's a Democrat. 
This guy was fascinating to me. I wanted to just sit and learn from it because we agreed. We agreed on, on the truth of Scripture, what it says. We, we have the same creeds and confessions in common. I wanted to, what, what is it that, that, that makes you think this way? I, I just want to listen. And that was okay, even though I vote Republican, because we agreed on Jesus Christ. Because we agreed on him, I was interested. Okay, how do you, how do you think the way you do? If we allow anything besides the truth of the gospel to divide us, we blaspheme the name of Christ. When we, when we divide over things that, that's not related to the truth of the gospel, then we basically say that Christ isn't good enough. He can't unify us. These differences of the world, those are more important. And what we see is more important than what is spiritually true. That's, that's blasphemy. We're disregarding Christ. Only Jesus Christ can heal the divisions in this world. Only he can. Only he can make us celebrate true diversity. Nothing else that we could have in common would bring as many people together as he will and does. That MSU researcher who did that study said, these trends are so strong, it's unlikely policy can change it. When you're talking about diversity, people can't come together. It's unlikely policy can change it. Let's show them it can. Christ can bring any people together. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, you've created all things and all people everywhere. Lord, we want... We don't want an artificial unity or just a superficial diversity. Lord, we want to be unified by who you are. We want to all be drawn to you. And we pray, Lord, that we would be able to overcome any other differences as long, Lord, as the truth of your gospel and your son, Jesus Christ, is central. Lord, may that be reflected in who we are as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.